this is the first panel on the life of Fidel Castro. Um, Fidel is just someone, you know, whichever part of the world you are in, just reading about him is, uh, and looking at the things he did is an, is an, is an amazing experience. He was, you know, involved in at least three great struggles, you know, against Batista, struggle to build a socialist country, and importantly, to continue socialism after the collapse of the Soviet Union, which was, and, and you know, I was thinking of what to say about Fidel, and I decided to say a quote which has always stuck with me. It's maybe one of the first things I've read about him. It's a quote by Che, uh, and he says, Fidel has his own special way of fusing himself with the people, which can be appreciated only by seeing him in action. At the great public mass meetings, one can observe something like the dialogue of two tuning forks, whose vibrations interact, producing new sounds. Fidel and the masses begin to vibrate together in a dialogue of growing intensity until they reach a climax in an abrupt conclusion, crowned by a cry of struggle and victory. And the imagery, as always, I've always found it profound and beautiful. And in particular, the connection with people that Fidel always had. And we have an uh, amazing panel to discuss discuss Fidel and his life. We have Felix Wilson, who is a senior Cuban diplomat. He was ambassador to the Bahamas. He was deputy chief uh, in the Cuban interest section in the United States. Uh, we have Skipper Bailey, who is a long-time activist. Uh, he's been doing solidarity with Cuba and Venezuela. He's also a documentary filmmaker. And we have Jahan Chaudhary, who is a young organizer, intellectual, based in Philadelphia. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Felix. I don't have a name. I'll try to do my best to please you. I'm honored to have been invited here. It's a coincidence that I'm visiting the United States because I have a daughter who lives in the... I have a daughter who lives in... Kentucky. I'm visiting now. And uh, that's why I'm say, I say that I'm honored to have been invited here. And I thank uh, Mr. Montero and the organizers Thank you, Skipper Bailey, who have helped me to be here today. And I wanted also to express my gratitude for the presence here today of a friend of mine, a friend of Cuba, a Cuban, a friend of the Cuban Revolution, Ms. Pedro Sierra, He's sitting here today. He came to meet you in this place. in the States, he was uh, uh, the first Negro player, baseball player, to be signed, the last, I'm sorry, the last, the first was Mini Minoso. He was the last Negro player to be signed by the Major League Club. He was with the Washington Senators until 1971. And uh, once I arrived here in once I arrived in D.C., I called him and he said, no, no, I'm going to be there tomorrow. <laughs> it is in the year so. so I thank you for coming, Pedro, to share this beautiful day with us. I was born, and I think, uh, when I speak about my life, my life summarizes what Fidel Castro has represented, not only for me, but for millions of Cubans and millions of people all over the world. I, <clears throat> as I said, I was born in Guantanamo. I'm now 65 years old. I was eight years old in, in 1959. My mother had separated my father and uh, traveled to Havana to look for a job. She traveled in Havana, to Havana in 1956 and left me and my sister behind in Guantanamo. Some people, you know, do not understand properly what Guantanamo 
Portuguese and they think that when I say Guantanamo, they think that I was born at the base. <laughs> no, Guantanamo is a province in Cuba, right? That has a bay, right? Like this, bay. It's one of the biggest in the world, the Guantanamo Bay. And then this area here is occupied by the US with the base. The rest is the province, and that is where I was born. I went to Havana with eight because my mother in 1859 decided to bring me to Havana to join her. And uh, I had not attended school because when I was left behind by her, I was left with my grandmother. My grandmother was blind and uh, I didn't have time to go to school because I had to be in the streets begging, getting some money to make us living there in Guantanamo. But then in 59, when Fidel Castro came to power, my mother brought me to Havana. And then I began going to school then, with eight years. So I was very late. And uh, I was given the possibility to go into, I don't know what you call it, we call it in Cuba, accelerated courses. From first, third, and then from fifth to first year of uh, high school. That's when I got you know, leveled and uh, I was able to continue my studies. I read political science and also sociology at the University of Havana. I became a diplomat in 1978. And in 1977, I went to Angola. I went to Angola as a diplomat. Uh, that time, Cuban troops were there. Some people uh, have been questioning why Cuba was there. But Cuba was not there in 1975 when the, the, the biggest group of people went there. Cuba had already met with the Angolan leaders. Che Guevara met, met, the, uh, me met uh, the president of Angola, Agostinho Neto, in Congo Brazzaville in 1965. But even before that, Cuba was related to Africa with help to Algeria. In Algeria, you know, Ahmed Dembela was one of the leaders of the revolution then. And in 1963, Cuba began cooperating with Algeria. So Cuba's involvement in Africa wasn't new and did not begin only in Angola. It was way before that, because many people do not know exactly all of these details. And that is also a show of the contribution that Fidel Castro has given to humanity as well. So I went to Angola in 1979. I spent in Angola five years, almost six years. From there, I was posted to Zimbabwe. I attended the summit of the non aligned country that took place in Zimbabwe in 1986. From Zimbabwe, I was posted to Nigeria, where I was three and a half years. And then I went back to Angola. I witnessed the withdrawal of the Cuban troops from Angola. I witnessed the first ever election taking place in Angola in 1992. And I was there, and uh, I left Angola in 1994. And then in 1996, I was posted to Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C., I was a deputy chief of the Cuban intersection, which is like an embassy, but then we didn't have embassy. We only had intersection after agreement between President Carter and our president. Both countries decided to set up intersection in Washington and Havana, led by what we called chief of the intersection. That was an ambassador. But then, since we didn't have diplomatic relations, we could not have embassies. So we had intersection. And I was the deputy there. I was there for four and a half years. I left Washington in 2000. I went to Cuba. And then I was posted to the Bahamas, where I was consul general and uh, ambassador. I supported ambassador there until 2007 when I returned to Cuba and then I retired. But I need to uh, give you a couple of experiences that I have. 
show you that I, as I always say, am the son of the Cuban Revolution. And I'm probably saying that, why? Because had it not been for the Cuban Revolution, I don't even know if I was going to be alive today. Yeah. Because I would have been left in Guantanamo. I don't even know whether I would have been able to go to school. I would have never thought of going to Havana and going to the University of Havana and uh, much less to be a diplomat and represent my country as a mother. But that summarizes you know, what I have been and what the revolution has done for me. Let me mention you a couple of experiences that I have because it is important being a black person to have become a diplomat and ambassador in Cuba. I mentioned uh, Skipper and I mentioned a few other friends that I'm writing a book on my experiences. Because I think that to be black, to be diplomat, and to be an ambassador in Cuba represents a lot, not only for the Cuban black, but it represents a lot because that shows the world that a person that has black skin in Cuba is given the opportunity to evolve in life and to be himself. <laughs> this does not mean that we don't have problems in Cuba. We still have a lot of problems. When I say we, I mean the black. I can share with you an experience that I had when I was in Washington this year. Because when I was in Washington, I used to be directly connected with the African American community, with the Congressional Black Caucus. And uh, while in Washington was when I met Skip Bailey through Paso for Peace. I don't know if, whether you are aware of Paso for Peace activities in Cuba and the solidarity that they have shown with the Cuban people over the years. When I was in D.C., I used to be close to the Congressional Black Caucus. There was one day that the Congressman Rangel calls me because there was going to be an event on race in Cuba, sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University in, in, in Washington. And then uh, Rangel was asked to be the keynote speaker. And uh, the event World on race in Cuba. Rangel uh, called the office in Washington and then he asked me to go because he wanted me to go and, and he wanted to have an exchange with me. But the ambassador was here, my boss. I was a deputy. When the ambassador was not in town, I then was in charge. But then the ambassador was in town. So uh, I was not supposed to go and meet a member of Congress just by myself. Then I asked the ambassador to go because I told him that the congressman wanted to speak to me. He said, no problem, go. Then I went, sat down with uh, Rangel, and then uh, he was then, I think, the chief of the Ways and Means Committee was very powerful, one of the most important people in the country. But then he was asked to speak about Cuba, a country which with, uh, he was uh, very much related because he had sponsored plenty of, uh, of uh, <coughs> sponsors of uh, many laws and uh, resolutions favoring Cuba, the lifting of the embargo and all of that. Then he sits with me and he says, uh, Felix, uh, I want to speak to you about raising Cuba. I said, okay, no problem, I'm open. Then he says, uh, okay, tell me how is racism in Cuba? Don't tell me a lie, because I know Cuba. If you lie to me, I will know. I said, no problem, I'll be honest with you. And then I began telling him about my story, my history, as I have talked to you, which, of course, includes some passages of racism in Cuba that I've been subjected to. One of them was, for instance, there was a time when I was going to, into a hotel in Cuba. It was in the 80s, I think. I was with my wife. My wife is 
light skin, black, like Miss Montero, but light skin. Then I have three daughters. One is as dark as I am, and the other two are light. And then uh, I wasn't allowed to go to, into the hotel. And uh, I said, why? I said, no, 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 you cannot. And then my family was allowed, but I wasn't. I began talking to the guy. I called the manager of the hotel, and at the end I was allowed. But that's a passage I wanted to, I mentioned him. And I also mentioned him, another passage of a girl that I knew who was dating a black person. The father was a member of the Communist Party. And the lady decided to expose the father and she went to the meeting of the party cell. At the party cell, she explained to the members of the party the father's identity. The father was expelled from the party, right? And she continued and uh, at the end, ultimately, she married the black person. And I mentioned to him a few other experiences. The Congress man was so pleased with me that he thanked me and then he said to me, you can't imagine how grateful I am for you to come and speak honestly with me. I'm giving you these two examples just to tell you that even though we have had a lot of uh, achievements in Cuba as far as uh, race relations is concerned, we still are way ahead and Fidel has spoken at length about it. I also remember when I went to Cuba accompanying a delegation from Trans-Africa. That was in 1998. Uh, Danny Glover was a member of the delegation. Randall Robinson was the one that was uh, presiding uh, Trans-Africa. And we met Fidel. And at that meeting, Tavis Smiley asked Fidel about this. How is race in Cuba? And Fidel said, in 1959, when we came to power, we decided to eliminate all the previous laws by which racism was in place in Cuba. And Fidel said, I was there. Fidel said, well, we were naive. Because doing that was not enough. And pounding on the table, he said, well, we have to finish with it. So he was, very mad. he was very conscious, and I can tell you that Fidel was a person, I think him and Raul, his brother, who is now the president of Cuba, those are the two major leaders in Cuba who have been speaking loudly about this question. I always say that in a society like ours, made up of 11 plus million people, our population, the black population, varies because some people say that it is 40% and 60% white. Some people said that in those, in that 60%, some uh, mixed people are included and therefore, as you can see in the States, those are African Americans. The proportion is different. And so there are different figures, right? But uh, there is a large population of blacks in Cuba. Right? And this is a problem that we have faced, are still facing. He has been very loudly speaking about it, Raul as well. And uh, we're still fighting in Cuba for this. Place. So don't think that Cuba is perfect. We have always said, and I have always said, whatever I have spoken, that we are not as good as our friends think that we are who we are not as bad as our enemies think. And uh, I can tell you that this kind of conference where people discuss, people exchange about Cuba, about our achievements, about what we have accomplished all along these years, is very important because Cuba was not known in 1959. Cuba, the world, <coughs> known for casinos and mafia, people visiting there, and tourism. And then Fidel came to power and he made Cuba known in the world. And ever since, you can imagine that as of today, Cuba has sent 
more than 700,000 doctors to other countries. Cuba has, Cuba has now the infant mortality rate, one of the lowest in the world, compared to the United States, the overall country, but better than many cities in the United States. Life expectancy in Cuba is 77 years for women and 75 for men. In Cuba, in 1859, life expectancy was 55 years. So you can imagine, in 1959, we only had 3,000 doctors left. We had 6,000 overall with 3,000 came to the United States. There were only 3,000 left. Now we have uh, thousands and thousands of doctors enough to send to work in other countries. Our, our, our health system and our educational system are one of the best in the world. We may not have some resources, some raw materials to make medicines or so, because, you know, the embargo is also something that is pushing on us. I don't blame everything on the embargo. We cannot blame everything on the embargo. Because uh, we have also had some difficulties ourselves. Mismanagement. Raul has spoken about it, you know. Raul called it the eternal embargo. <coughs> so everything is combined. And sometimes, you may hear or read that uh, there is lack of uh, this product in Cuba, this other product, but the bag was the main source of the lack of many things that we need in Cuba. Right? And we have been in bag since 1962. Everybody knows it. We are fighting, President Obama did uh, his best. I don't know how this new president is going to be. He has said that he's going to revert most of the things that Obama has done with Cuba, I don't know whether he will finally do. Whatever he does, he will be there. Mm. And Cuba will be there. And Cuba depends on the solidarity of the people all over the world. Because Cuba has always said that we're not what we have been and what we are today had it not been for the solidarity with other people, of other people, like the Soviet Union, some socialist countries, and some other countries that came to Cuba to help when we needed the most that help. So I don't know whether you know I should continue on this or I could give the possibility to you to ask questions. I'm open to answer whatever questions you make, if I can, right? I didn't come here to speak, you know, in politics or whatever. I'm talking about my own experiences. I didn't come here to speak about the game. The, the, the U.S. government or whatever. I came here to change my experience with you because I'm visiting the country. So uh, I will have to abide by the rules of uh, a person who is invited to a country. However, I don't think that I am going to say anything more than what I've told you. Because I think that the appropriate things have been told by me. And I'm open, you know. The way you ask questions, I am going to be able to answer them and uh, you'll be able to make a judgment by yourself and see how best you can continue helping Cuba. As I know that you have been doing, because sometimes you, you, not, you, know, you are not even aware of, uh, of the steps that you are taking. But whatever you do, reading about Cuba, learning more about Cuba, having friends with Cubans that can speak to you about Cuba, visiting the country, right? Relating to people who know and can give you an experience about Cuba. That is a way of helping Cuba too. Right? And Cuba needs that. We have always been able to need this support from the world. And at this time, we continue to need you, your help, and whatever you can do for my country. Thank you very much. And I'm open. Yeah, I had to tell you. 1968. I was a freshman at Antioch College. Um, 
We had just created the first Afro-American Studies Department, and uh, Dr. Montreal was not a doctor at that time, but he was a hardcore Philadelphia black communist revolutionary guy. 1968. I say that because I want to start with the photos. They, I want Wilson sort of to join me in giving you a little explanation of the history of Fidel, and particularly as it relates to people of African descent. Starting with our mentor, Tony and I, maybe some of the other guys, Henry Winston. Fidel called him Winnie. And I want to put this in the context. Henry Winston was in Terre Hut, Indiana, in a federal penitentiary. So I want to date you some. And at that time, the United States had begun to do reconnaissance missions over Cuba right before the conflict between the Soviet Union and the United States based on the fact that Cuba had accepted defensive arms to defend their revolution. And they shot the plane down. And they had the power from that plane. And Fidel likes to talk about, you know, having this engagement with the United States government. And he said, listen, if you want your pilot back, give me Winnie. Let Henry Winston go. And we sit and say, well, you know, Fidel, he said, and he talks about this all the time, whenever he went to the Soviet Union or went to the German Democratic Republic for the international communist meetings, everybody looked to talk to Winnie. A man who had lost his sight but Fidel said he could never understand how Winnie could see around the corner and now in the corner around the bridge. Anytime he had any real questions about trying to understand the dynamic political situation of the United States, he wanted to talk to Winnie. Well, okay, tell this my boss right here. <laughs> you know, Winnie was beginning to have headaches in the federal penitentiary. And this is, you know, we're talking about the 50s, we're talking about hardcore segregation, and we're talking about a number five level prison. It's a prison that Winnie was in. He's doing McCarthyism. And Winnie was beginning to have headaches. He had written and tried to make contact with everybody outside, but nobody was moving. So then, some women who had been very active in the party and whatnot went out to see Winnie. And when they went out to see Winnie, they determined that he had a tumor. So they had him shipped to the federal prison in New York to get an operation. When they did the operation, they thought Winnie was going to die. But when he came out, first thing he said, they took my sight, but not my vision. And the authorities were very <coughs> upset. I'm not, I got this firsthand from Mary Kaufman, who was the attorney for Winnie at that time. They thought that he was going to die. Why? Because J. Edgar Hoover, for 14 years, wrote in all the FBI files that the most dangerous American, the most dangerous American from 1937 to the time he passed away was Henry Winston. So for all you young people, you can go online, you can research it, it will come out, Henry Winston, and why? Because he spoke about black-white unity, because he had a great vision because he was a great organizer and he believed in a structural change to the American society. So I can tell you, every time we ever saw Fidel, that's the first thing he would talk about, winning, 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 winning. So that's the first thing. If you go down here, if you can look at this picture here, I like to do this, I like to take this to university because they always say that Fidel never went to Angola. And if you see here, Here is Fidel in Angola. <laughs> okay. So let me sort of tell you the background behind this. But I, I, I was very fortunate. You know, I'm an Afro-American brother down in Alabama in my 50s. So I got a chance to know Duke Wilson, a lot of the old black guys who were Fidel's comrades, his right 
him in, the guys who have the assignments. And so they talk about that right before the independence of Angola, November 11, 1976, he went to China. This is Neto, right here, the president. And the Chinese said, well, look, we'll give you all the support you want, but you've got to go against the Soviet Union. Neto being a very independent political thinker, turned him down, got on the train, and went to the Soviet Union. He went to the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union said, told him the same thing. So he went to East Germany. And when he went to East Germany, he met with a guy by the name of Ulysses Lestrada. Ulysses was Fidel's right-hand man, a black guy out of Santiago, had been with Fidel, you know, since the early days, <coughs> was number two in intelligence, wrote the book about Tanya. But he was now in East Germany. So him and Neto link up. And Neto said, listen, man, I need some training. I need some aid because we have intelligence that's saying that the South Africans are not going to let us, along with Unida and FNLA, have our independence. So he tells Ulysses this. Ulysses gets on the plane, goes back, and speaks directly to Fidel. You got to understand the dynamics of Cuban in reference to caring about people of African descent. Fidel's a hell of a guy with that. I'm talking personally. I know how, how he feels. Wilson does too. He, you know, he just can't, you know, let me do his thing up in here. Fidel got all of the black soldiers, all of the religious guys, all of the Abaqua, which is a secret men's organization. He said, look, you know, what can we do to aid in the defense and the independence of the Angola people? And the black Cubans chose to say, Fidel, let's go. Let's rumble. I'm not talking about no second hand, I'm talking about guys in the military who my boys told me right off the bat. They armed up, they named the mission Operator Carlotta, and they sent 37,000, 3,700 troops the first time to Angola to meet and fight the South African troops. Now Tony knows directly about this because we have organized through Winnie, the Anti-Imperialist League, and we were fighting very hard for the right for the United States to recognize the independence of Angola after this long liberation struggle. And right here, and, and Wilson, you know, you can chime in if you want to, you can see, again, Fidel in Angola. Here he is with Neto. Here he is with all the children. So we're not talking about a president that's like on the abstract side, like, you know, giving orders. No, no. My boys tell me when they left to go to Cuba, Fidel met them and gave his speech. They said Fidel was messed up, he was hurt, because this was the first time his troops, his soldiers, were going into battle and he wasn't going to lead them. So, and, you know, feel free to ask what's in this. So when you went to Fidel's office, there was a whole room of how he was watching and organizing and orchestrating the fight for independence for the Angolan people. And here you see a guy like Brother Wilson that was right there on the front line. And you got to, he, he, he left out one thing that's very important. The reason that his mother sent for him to go from Guantanamo, which is the east, which is so enough all black, 36 miles from Haiti, 36 and a half miles from Jamaica, is because the revolution said now you can get education. It was the it was, it was the it was the structural change of the society that provided this man as well as many other people for African descent the opportunity to get an education. So now you see Fidel here. This is on the battlefield. 
How many troops was it, Russell? How many? How many troops did you guys send? How many troops? 55,000. They sent 55,000 troops to fight the South African Army, the Israeli Army. And when they left and go, Fidel says it all the time, all they took was their dead bodies of their soldiers. No diamonds, no oil, no gas, nada. Brought their soldiers back. Here, this is a classic here. This is Fidel and Allende. Again, the brothers are locked down, Ulysses Estrada. Again, he is in charge of the military attaché for the Cuban government. He goes back and tells Fidel, Fidel, there's a great possibility there might be a mutiny in the Chilean army. Fidel goes to Chile to speak to Allende, to tell Allende about it, but Allende, because of the long history of the Chilean military, does not believe that they're going to have a mutiny, that they're going to try to overthrow the government with the financial and political support of the United States government. They attack Allende, the rest is history, but Ulysses Estrada got on the roof of the Cuban embassy, but you have to understand, the Cubans got a weird thing about their property and their embassies. Wilson can't speak about it, but I can tell you about it. They armed, and their embassy is their property, and Ulysses Estrada and the Cuban soldiers stay on the roof in the embassy for three days, battling with the Chilean army until the Chileans say, hey, quit it, we're going to let you guys go home. Now, the, the Cubans going to be back and back, and that starts with Fidel. It starts with Fidel. It starts right there, but they're not going back. They don't back back. All my friends who are in the military, they tell you, they got a style like the Vietnamese. They go forward. They go forward. Okay. Here, this is back in the 50s. And here you can see all of the soldiers from the United States military in the bars. You know, and the young Afro-American trying to bag for cash. That's the old Cuba. You don't see nothing like that now. Here, it's a very sad photo. This is a photo of all the caskets from when in Trinidad, the plane carrying the sportsmen from Cuba was bombed. It was 128, 130 Wilson that sort of died in that yeah. plane crash. 123. 123. So you see here, are all the two caskets of all of the Cubans that died in that plane crash, which is still remembered today. The Cubans don't forget nothing about their soldiers. Now, I'm going to tell you that off the break. Here you have Fidel in the early years before they took state power. But just like Wilson talked about his political experience in the universities, that's a long tradition particularly among the people of African descent, going back to Maceo, of fighting for independence. When you get towards Santiago, La Maya, Guantanamo, Baracoa, Baracoa, that's the stronghold of the revolution. Fidel will tell you off the break, like he said for Wilson, all of his top guys, they come from the East. Right here, this is a great one. Sakatare. Sakatare. Excuse me, Mr. Mr. Sik. Anyway, you guys know. <laughs> Dr. Montreal always corrects me. But what am I saying, though? That all of these liberation movements, all through Southern Africa, Vietnam, all through Latin America, all through Central America, they were supported, grown, fed by Fidel and the Cuban people. Right. Off the break. <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> now I just want to talk briefly about Fidel and Hugo.
Hugo Chavez. All right. Because <laughs> Fidel was Hugo's father, and Chavez loved to brag about any time he had a political question, a political problem, or he needed to know something, he could call Fidel on the telephone, and Fidel would give him the 411. And if it was not something they could talk about on the phone, he would gas the plane up and go talk to Fidel in person. But let me explain why. Because when Chavez took power, he took power by election, but he had tremendous resistance from the petty bourgeois from the middle class. So what happened? The Cubans sent 21,000 personnel, from clowns to doctors, theater people, agricultural people, technicians, security, intelligence. And that happened all over Latin America, Argentina, Bolivia, Ecuador, Jamaica. The Cubans, starting from 1960, were hell-bent on trying to structurally change the whole dynamics of Latin America and Central America, and really the whole planet. You know, and Fidel used to always like to say about Chavez, A, that he had an incredible brain. B, that he had a great, great heart. But more important, that he was prepared to take the resources of the Venezuelan people and try to structurally change the whole Americas. And that's when they began to develop these kind of trade where it wasn't involved with dollars, it was cows, or health care. I lived in Balavento, which is an all-black area of Venezuela. All of the doctors, all the teachers, all the economists, they were all Cubans. They are sent by Fidel on a mission to help protect the Venezuelan Revolution. So I'm going to sit down, but I can tell you all a whole lot more. You know. Hi, everyone. So you just heard from uh, two people whose lives were so touched uh, by the great Fidel Castro. And what I can offer you today is the views of a young person who's living in this time of great ideological and political crisis <coughs> struggling to understand the steps forward. And I can share with you my own perspective, uh, based only on reading and videos, of what I think we can all learn, a few things of the many that we can all learn about the life of this uh, great revolutionary. The first thing that really stands out to me about Fidel is the way he had a connection to the revolutionary heritage of the Cuban people. If you look at the language of the uh, 26th of July movement, and even afterwards, you see as much reference to figures like Jose Marti and the great struggles uh, for independence in Cuba and the great struggles of slaves for freedom as you do uh, to the ideas of Marx and Lenin. It is that, that fusion that I think is very powerful. I think it should remind us to study our own revolutionary heritage in this country, to try to understand uh, the black radical tradition, to try to understand the ideas uh, behind the great movements that have at times shaken uh, the foundations of this country. And I think added to that, uh, as a leader, it was Fidel's emphasis on culture and art. And I think that's part of the motivation for why we uh, were very purposeful in including so much art uh, in today's uh, symposium. And it goes back to an important quote by Marti when he said, a people can only be free if they have culture. And I think Fidel uh, understood that within cultures, particularly the cultures of the most oppressed, like the Afro-Cubans or the Afro-Americans, uh, are the great seeds of revolt. So again, I think this should encourage us to look back at our heritage and to identify those things uh, within 
both the social movements and the artistic movements that can be uh, the potential for revolt today. Also, one thing we've talked a lot about today, I think, is uh, Fidel's emphasis on education. Uh, it's very interesting when Fidel talks about his days as a university student. He says that he hardly ever went to class uh, in the University of Havana in, in the days when it was very much an exclusive club of the privileged and the elite. But what he did find very useful were the great libraries. And he read voraciously and spent most of his time outside with other students and with working class people in Havana discussing the insights gained from the books of Marx and Lenin and Marti. And after taking power, we see the ways in which he emphasized literacy. And if you read his interviews on this topic over and over again, he emphasizes popular education in, in shaping the minds of the Cuban people. And he credits that as the reason that Cuba has been able to resist imperialism. Because the people have a great sense of competence within themselves. Because they have a great sense of, uh, of the importance of political education and the ways in which education can be a gateway to revolution. Education should not be something kept in the ivory towers of the bourgeoisie, but something that should be shared with the masses. And I think connected to this is the importance we see in Fidel's strategy of a very clear social and ideological analysis on questions of strategy. From the very beginning, Fidel distinguished himself from the other leaders of revolutionary trends within Cuba in both his organic connection to the Cuban people as well as his very clear and sober understanding of the social forces at play in Cuba as well as uh, the global balance of power. And after coming to power, he understood uh, the importance of understanding the global economic and political framework in order to identify the weak links of imperialism in the places the other panelists have mentioned, in Southern Africa and Latin America. And through all this, I think he learned the value of socialism through practice. I think it would be uh, very true to call him a great scientist in the truest sense, someone who was humble in understanding that science means experimentation, that we should always take seriously the consequences of our actions and study very intently. If you read his interviews, and his, uh, particularly in his great uh, autobiography, you understand the seriousness which with he approached uh, intellectual questions because he didn't see them as abstract things. He saw them as life and death for himself and the Cuban Revolution. And I think from both his person as well as the way in which he emphasized education within his party and within the Cuban people, we can see the value of collective education, of the way we can all educate each other, bring our experiences, experiences which are very much removed from the uh, ivory towers and the abstract forms of education available um, in the institutions. And also I think in this time of great ideological confusion, it's important for us to have a clear understanding in order to oppose the ideological misleadership that we're seeing in this great time of crisis for American capitalism and imperialism. So if I were to sum up a few things which I think um, we should take from his example of revolutionary leadership. I would start with humility. He distinguished himself, I think, from even the other leaders of the socialist camps, which is one of the reasons the Cuban Revolution stays alive, and one of the reasons Cuba was able to make advances in areas other countries of the socialist bloc were not able to, such as the environment and LGBT rights because Fidel understood the importance of self-criticism and humility and the importance of admitting when one is wrong. And with that, that's the reason he had the trust of the Cuban people for so many decades. And then I would emphasize the importance of camaraderie. There's a great story that uh, Juan Almeida, one of his oldest Afro-Cuban comrades, tells of when they were going to Cuba on the Grandma Expedition. 
and everyone was very nervous and tense, and a comrade had fallen overboard. But Fidel stopped the expedition and said they would not move an inch until they had found him. They searched for many hours and found him, but with that, everyone was reassured that the leader would not leave anyone behind. That it wasn't about him, that it was about all of them, and it was about the importance of building a new Cuban society. I think in our times in which even among the left, even among activists, there is a sense of, of egoism and, and inflating the individual, we should understand the importance of camaraderie. And I think connected to that is empathy. Empathy both for the Cubans and empathy for all the victims of oppression throughout the world. It's interesting. I, I won't cover what the other panels have talked about, Fidel's contributions to uh, in solidarity with Africans in Africa. But it's interesting that after an interview shortly after 9-11, Fidel said, if anyone can find one quote in which I have criticized or attacked the American people, I will cut off my arm. We've been the subject of great terrorism by the United States, but we have never launched a single terrorist attack in retaliation. Because Fidel understood that with a clear class analysis, one can separate the rulers from the rule. And one can identify uh, the weak links within these oppressive structures. And uh, I think the final most important thing was both his vision of the future and the way in which he connected to a sense of history. Not only did he understand the importance of the great struggles in Cuba that had preceded him and let his actions be guided uh, through living in that great spirit of history of Cuban revolutionaries. But he also understood the great debt that Cuba owed to Africa, which was one of the reasons that he felt Cuba had a responsibility to give solidarity to the peoples of Angola and Mozambique in their struggles for liberation. And I'll end uh, with two quotes that I, I read from his autobiography, which I found very inspiring. At one point, uh, the interviewer asks him, uh, what is it that keeps you going? You've lived through uh, so many defeats for socialism. And uh, you've lived through so many crises with the special period and the embargo and so on. Fidel says, whenever I feel discouraged, I repeat to myself, a better world is possible. A better world is possible. A better world is possible. And then, in response to a question in which Fidel says that human beings should value education and culture, even over food and shelter, the interviewer says, Fidel, I think you're too much of an incorrigible dreamer. In response, says, Fidel says, there's no such thing as dreamers. And you can take that from a dreamer who's had the privilege of seeing realities that he was never even capable of dreaming. So let us keep in mind his great words challenge ourselves in the way he challenged himself to emulate his revolutionary heritage. Let us do the same with our revolutionary heritage. Thank you. I heard about you on UID. Oh, oh, I, I said, what is this? I knew nothing of this. So I came out here immediately. I was a soldier in the U.S. Army back in 1975 to 79. And I remember in 1976, they were, I was in Fort Bragg. They were about to send us to Angola. I knew of Angola, but not very, very little. But I, I knew I was not going to go fight my brothers. I, did, I knew it was somewhere in Africa, and I said, I'm not going to go to fight my own people. So I was already working on being a conscious objector. But uh, I didn't really, really know a whole lot about it. But to hear you guys speak about this really opened up a whole lot and answered a lot of questions. And so um, I am inter eternally grateful for this here in which in this panel. I love what, you, what you're speaking about, and I have 10 million questions, so I let somebody else take the mic. But uh, uh, I'm so happy to be here. Good afternoon, it's really uh, an honor to be here, and much an honor to be together with my friend for many years, Felix Wilson. I want to talk to you from the standpoint of view of a black Cuban who was there before the revolution. And even though I left uh, for no other reason, just to, as a professional sport, 
to the years understand that revolution is the solution. I, I want to let you know that before Fidel Castro and the revolution came into power, how much of a, ah, trying to find the right word, how difficult it was for those of us of black skin to be getting a good education. There were hardly or none doctors or lawyers in Cuba before the revolution. Myself, I wanted to become a, a drastic engineer and uh, in order for me to get a scholarship to a school, a friend of my dad who was running for councilman, good friend of him, grew up together, said my dad had to get him 200 votes. Hell of a friendship. Okay. And I guess it never became, I became a professional athlete instead. I, I, there were many, many times, and I talk about it anywhere I go, where those of us with black skin in the city, the city of Havana where I was born and raised, in the public transportation, black bus drivers could not drive in the area of risky people. That was not allowed to. They worked many times, okay, where the police, we're talking about police brutality, that police brutality during the Batista regime. Uh, they were no question about it. In the city of Havana, where I was born and raised, there were many times where even you could not be in the area where you were a black skinned person. I tell you, I was telling an earlier anecdote to the people in here. I went to, I was messing around, messing with a girl, you know, it was in the, before high school years. And she was living in a, with her aunt in a ritzy area. Aunt was a maid, not that she would live in the ritzy area. So I went to see her, and <clears throat> that after 11 o'clock at night, I just went home, trying to catch a bus back home. Of course, I only had like about eight cents that was at the bus fare. And the chief, the, one of the chief of police, a guy used to call La Rata, they used to call him the rat at that time came in a cruiser and he says, hey black boy, what are you doing here? I said, I'm waiting for the bus. He said, where comes the bus? I said, no, that goes the other way. He said, I told you, here comes the bus. So I had to jump across the street and go catch a bus and go to my grandfather area, okay? And because that, uh, that was it, okay? There were many places where black people we're waiting. There was a couple of anecdotes, you know, were very famous in the city of Havana. This guy was waiting for the bus, and they, he, the guy came over and said, what are you doing here? Waiting for the bus. Okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to do make my rounds when I come around. I don't want to see you face to face. The guy said, okay. The guy went around the light pole and said, are you still here? Boom, 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 boom. Okay, I was, that was horrible. If you were downtown during the late years of the Batista Revolution, the 26th of July movement was great, okay? It was very spread all over the city. Guy was, you know, pasting signs and everything like that. You were downtown during Christmas time, window shopping. A bomb will go off because they're, you know, the 26th, you know, bomb will go off. Boom, you got hurt. The police come and says, oh, you try to, they sabotage, right? Do good, do good, do good, do good. You had nothing to do with it, okay? And then every time a bomb will go off in the city of Havana, they will come and get you. So that's what you do, you join the 26th July movement. You didn't, you, you liked the movement or you didn't like it, they, the military intelligence service, the sin, will come in there and you, they, they, want, they want you to say something about where, who belongs to the movement that you want to say. 
Well, they take you into their little area down, down in the basement. They get one of these chairs, but it was like metal seat. They get a torch and they put it under the torch. When that seat got about as red as you can get, they take your pants off and you sit there until you talk. You talk about police brutality, okay? And if you were black, that was worse. I mean, so we had to, we were welcome what happened with up and on. In, in, the, in, the, in the other states, in the provinces, as we call it, in the country area, if a farmer didn't want to say anything about Castro, or he went through, we know he came through here, and, and uh, you gave him some supplies. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't, okay? You didn't say in favor of what they want to say, they beat the little woke out of you. So that farmer joined the Castro movement, okay? And then, because they knew, you know, that this thing had to come to an end, okay? When Castro came in, I was there. I was there. I nobody could tell me nothing what happened. There were some areas in the, in the country, in, in Cuba, where black people couldn't go to the park on a Sunday. You want to go in the park and sit there, okay? No, if you are the black people, you have to walk around the outside of the park. You couldn't walk in the middle of the park. There were clubs for black and clubs, special social clubs for white. The blacks couldn't go to no white clubs. But the whites would come into our club and they were welcome. But when, I'm gonna use the expression, when the man came in there and he said, we ain't had no more black or white clubs in there. Because we're all equal. If you look back to our history, okay, we, other than the American, the Native Indians that came in there when Colombo came in discovered whatever he said he was ready to discover, okay, and when, they, when those Spaniards went to Africa, brought Africans into the country. Cuba was the first country in Latin America to have Africans come in there to work the land as slaves. Then those Africans mixed with the Chinese people that came in there. So we got a very, very much mixed background, but a strongly African background, okay? And what happened, okay? You were saying people, no, nah, no, nah, no. A man said no. So because those who were from Spain, the Spain close to the Moors, and the Moors are black, anyway. <laughs> so those people decided that they wouldn't want to cooperate with whatever ideas he had. The idea of progress, the idea of having more blacks in school. Not teachers, but students. Okay, more doctors, more all of that. That was part. So when he said we need to sacrifice, okay, about the economy, we know what's gonna happen. And some of those mostly white people decided to leave Cuba and not support the revolution or the ideas and went to Miami. They didn't take the property, they signed over the property to them. Because he said you will have a business, you're gonna leave. The bridge is going to be, so you have to sign it over to the government. So that's what happened. He didn't take it. I was there. I tell you what, I know what's happened. You know, and I'm, I'm very proud of what happened because I didn't benefit from it, but my family, my brothers and my sister, my, my nephews and all have benefited from that and free education, from that different idea, okay, that, that, that we had. Felix, my friend, that's one of them, right there, okay? And, it's, and it, to me, you know, I'm forever proud to be a Cuban, okay? Question, so in the age of Obama and liberal identity politics, we have a lot of people saying they want to end racism, but it's nothing on the level of the kind of revolutionary way that you're all talking about it. So I guess I'm just wondering, we as people who are trying to wage revolutionary struggle to fundamentally change the nature of race relations, how would you suggest we differentiate ourselves and uh, speak in a language of resistance that hasn't been co-opted by liberalism? Me. Oh. Well, first of 
first thing I can say is you gotta keep studying. It's really an issue, particularly in this period of history, that we gotta study. We gotta study, we gotta be very honest with one another, you know, be very self-critical. But we have to prepare ourselves intellectually for this long, long struggle. You know, and I'm just amazed and, and very excited at the Saturday School and what you guys have been able to do here in Philadelphia, just the makeup of the school, how it looks, the women, the young people, the fact that you guys are like trying to tear down this whole American psychology, this whole way of how we deal with each other, and just keep studying and be very honest about it. I can tell you, I've been with this guy since 68. You talking about 50 years, he wants, to, he wants to be sad about it, but we've fought many struggles together and we've had a great life. You know, we can look back with honor and dignity because we didn't bend over. And that was because the ideas that we had in our mind kept us going. You know, a lot of guys drop out, a lot of women drop out. But now, I just want to say one thing too about the Cuban Revolution and about the economic boycott or the blockade. Fidel probably will go down in history as well as the Cuban people and Cuban leadership as the best people that organized not only their society, but try to change the whole world with a noose around their neck. A serious noose around their neck. And this guy, he, he, he's very modest. But I was on the hill with him, and we fought for almost two and a half years to try to get the United States government to let pharmaceutical companies in France, Italy, Greece, or whatever, sell medicine to Cuba. The blockade, the blockade, the blockade, the Cuban people are very proud, but they suffered tremendously, tremendously. And Fidel, and you talk about the question that you asked, they constantly were looking for an alternative, a real way not to have this confrontation in the United States, but to build their own society. You know what I'm saying? And, and, they, and they, when you go there, you see, they very, very, they constantly read and constantly trying to re-examine what happened. And again, after the Soviet Union collapsed, they went into a special period where they didn't have no food, okay? I mean, we didn't have no chicken, no milk, no eggs, zero. Okay, and that's for seven hard years. But if you talk about Santiago, you talk about La Maya, you talk about Guantanamo, the heart of that revolution, they didn't buck. Now, the Europeans bucked, but the Cubans, they went hard during the special period. And these guys, like this guy, this cats gave their life, and, and they're proud. All the guys that I know, they went to Germany, they went to Angola, they went to Algeria, they went to Vietnam. They provided medicine for Bolivia. I mean, that's what Chavez always used to talk about. The example of what the Cuban people meant to the Americans. Haiti, no doctors, all Cubans. Jamaica, no education, all Cubans. Guyana, you go all the way down the line. Fidel, I'm gonna tell you how this guy was. No, 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 I'm just give you a couple minutes. When Chavez got sick, the majority of the, of the doctors in Cuba are black women. Because Che was the head of education. He went and made sure all these girls in elementary school and junior high school became scientists to develop them as doctors. So the majority of the physicians that treated Chavez were black females. Now Fidel moved to the hospital. He moved in the hospital where Chavez was. Now, could you imagine? You know, he's sick, he's in his 80s. But this guy, these two guys, had this vision of going all the way to the end. You follow what I'm saying? And Fidel was there interacting with these women from Guantanamo, from La Maya, from these poor hills, from these countrysides, from Haiti, from Jamaica, trying to make sure that Chavez got the best medical care. But the brilliant thing is, you couldn't hold Hugo down. See, I, I'm gonna say out the break, I think he was poisoned. Ain't nobody, cause, cause I, I, I messed with the brother, he was never sick, he just all of a sudden, and everybody who treated him would always say, they would operate on him, 
with the best physicians from Cuba, the best physicians from China, the best physicians from Vietnam, the best oncologists, and once they operate on it, the tumor would come back faster and stronger. At the same time, Chavez was so dedicated to trying to maintain power in Venezuela that he wouldn't rest. If Fidel couldn't keep him down, then he would say, look, I'm cool. Let me out of here. I'm about to go run for president. I've got to try to stay down on my responsibility as a revolutionary leader. Chavez would tell you that all came from Fidel. And Fidel would tell you that when he needed to, to figure out what he had to do, you know what I'm saying? In the early 60s, you look at that brother right there, Henry Winston, who was that man's right there, main man. So we got a history that you guys got to maintain, you know, because now with Trump and what happened yesterday, we got to rumble. Oh, thank you. I, I'll just, I just wanted to briefly talk about uh, Megan's question about race and representation and how it connects to the Cuban Revolution. My own analysis uh, of the revolution is very interesting that we forget Batista, uh, the dictator, uh, was a person of color. He was the first leader of color of Cuba. So if all it takes to, to liberate uh, the masses of color is a leader of color in an oppressive structure, then they wouldn't have supported Fidel's revolt. But because Fidel and the mostly white, initially, guerrillas had such ideological clarity and appealed uh, materially to the interests of the Afro-Cubans, as well as the, the white Cubans, they decided to side with him and his forces over uh, Batista because they recognized the importance of uh, material needs over this question of uh, representation. So I think that's an important thing, thing to think over um, in the times we live in. I also want to say two things. In the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, there was a large participation in the Communist Party by people of African descent in Cuba. And Cuba had a number of secret societies, a number of cultural societies that were very political. Because you have to remember, up until 1912, the black Cubans might be the most advanced political course, class or strata in the Americas. I'm really perplexed about um, how Cuba's able to give people such a great education. And we here in the United States, with all the money and the wealth that we have, we have a failing educational system, especially in the urban areas. And I just want to know, you know, what could be done, you know, to bring about change to our educational system. It's just deplorable. We have dropout rates of 50% in some areas. And it's really heartbreaking because education really is a key to so many things. Well, well let, let me tell you something in Cuba. First of all, uh, education in Cuba, <clears throat> we had private schools in Cuba. Fidel stopped that. No private school, public school. All schools are public and compulsory. From childhood, all the way from there. You don't have to pay books, you don't have to pay we call it this uh, tuition, right? You don't pay nothing in Cuba. I, I was telling you about my experience in Guantanamo. In Guantanamo we had private schools owned by people, you know. <coughs> people could have their school, you know, associated with the Ministry of Education, but private schools. You have to pay the fees and all of that. I mean, for me, it was unthinkable to go to school. My mother had separated my father. My father used to be working at the Naval Base in Guantanamo. He began working there in 1947. And uh, my mother 
separated my father when I was three years old. And she moved with my grandmother. And that's where I was. Because my, my mother said, okay, you have to go. I have to move from Guantanamo. I have to see whether I can find a job. And then she went to Havana, the capital of a developing country then. Then she moved to Havana. That was 1956. And I was five years old. Then in 59, when Fidel comes to power, my mother sees the possibility and the opening for us to begin studying. And then I come to Havana. Free education, free everything. And I went through all levels. Why? Because the system gave me the possibility. And to be honest with you, I used to be living at the, uh, how do you call that, how you said, the area was a uh, place, different rooms, uh, different families living in, how do you call that? Uh-huh, uh, uh, Yeah, that was my mother lived. And I was living with my mother, my mother, my stepfather, myself, and then my sister came. And my mother had to make a night, sort of a division, with the sheet, covering that, dividing the room, and then she was living on this side with my stepfather, and me and my sister was living on one small bed. And inside that room, my mother had the sort of a kitchen, we had small thing to cook. You know, we didn't have, we, we did not even think on the refrigerator what we had. We used to go and buy ice, you see, big blocks of ice. And we had that there inside that room, right? To have the food left over, you know, for the next day. And that was our life. And that is how I began going to school. And at the same time, I participated in sports. Right, uh, a possibility given to me by the revolution. I'm black, living in a very black neighborhood in Cuba, right? And then that possibility was given to me, and I went to school, and at the same time, I went to sports. I went over and over and over, and then there was a time when I reached the university that I could not study in our room, there was only one room. I didn't have a, any, any, we didn't have anything else. And I had to put one ball, an extension, outside of the house with a chair. And I was one of the leaders of the University Students Association as well. And sometimes I had to study during the night until 2, 3 a.m. outside because I didn't have any possibility. And then I, I, I tell people, that I was rescued by the system. This is why I tell, I, 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 you know, I, I'm not lying to you. I'm being honest with you. Mm -hmm. I was rescued because it was this, the revolution that took me out of my neighborhood, put me at a school, and I used to be a member of the Cuban national team basketball and the junior team at the same time. But then all of that is possible because of what Fidel did before 1959, it was impossible. See what my friend was telling you. He had to go to pro, to play baseball. That was the only way they had. And then I could tell you, as Skipper was saying, you have to go to school. Sometimes we black people decide to drop off because we see on other areas an easiest way to get some money, to get some cash, no, 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 no. study hard. Try to be yourself. Of course, you have to be given the opportunity to study mm. as well. But that does not depend on, that depends on you, on the ways that you find the pressure you put on the authorities, you see? There have been many promises by this new president. I don't know whether he's going to fulfill all of them or not. But uh, you need to 
help your people. And you need to be yourself, study, raise up, and go up in society, <coughs> right? You have to be able to study hard, to share your views, to find a common sense in the society so that you can move ahead and put pressure on others to help the urban communities because I'm here. I read the news. I mean, and nobody likes the shootings and all of it that you see every day in the news shooting. And then uh, sometimes when you find out who these people are, sometimes they are the children of single parents, mother that uh, are by themselves bringing up their children. I mean, the situation is difficult. I'm not saying that you have to bring to the United States the revolution we did in Cuba, right? Because uh, the, the, the situation in Cuba was completely different and is and will always be different than yours. But you have to find your own solutions to your problems, right? And the only advice I can give you is that all of you, but I'm not talking only about black people, I'm talking about poor people. Because there are white poor people, there are uh, mixed, uh, there are people from other countries, from uh, the Middle East, from uh, the Arab countries who are poor as well. We need to study. We need to push ahead, to move ahead and see what we can do and to educate our children. In Cuba, if a parent does not allow his children or his child to go to school, he goes to prison. Education is compulsory in Cuba. Compulsory. The minimum level of education in Cuba is nine. Great, right? I went to I didn't pay one penny for anything. You can go from primary school all the way through a doctorate and you don't have to pay anything. It's exactly in health. You can go to Cuba. You can go for a minor injury or you can go for a of an open heart operation, you don't have to pay one penny. Thank you. That is the situation in Cuba. But your situation is different because there are two different systems. But the solutions in your country have to be found by yourself, you see? As we found ours in Cuba. Thank you guys for coming here. I'm happy to speak to you today. Um, just on the same line, um, just uh, further elaboration, just speaking about Philadelphia uh, specifically, um, thinking about the Cuban Revolution um, and what it means to have a, a population of people who are mostly literate, um, not even like political education, but they can, can actually read. In Philadelphia, you might not even, you know, you might even have a block of people that can fully read. So uh, to me, that's like astounding. Um, I just wanted to know if you have like uh, a specific because to have a revolution and have like a literacy rate that high, um, you can you can mandate the um, um, to have to have an education, but to actually have people read um, and uh, be on a literacy level uh, of acceptance um, to me is like the most important. Um, people that I know, people my age, cannot read. Right, uh, we went to the same schools, same block, same neighborhoods. You cannot read, so. Before you even have a political education, you can't even uh, fathom the information that's coming to you on the news. Um, you can't read newspapers. Some of the students that I work with um, literally get by day to day because they just recognize the color of signs. They can't read. So uh, I just wanted to know, like, what what is the energy behind? Um, if you were, if anybody's able to speak on it, the energy behind pushing pushing literacy, um, and uh, what initiatives should we take? Um, to make that uh, mandatory, um, not so, uh, to reiterate, uh, not like a political education specifically, even though that is important, but just to be able to read, um, because once you do that, you provide them the tools to make the decision um, to, to be active and however, but uh, we, uh, again, to have a country that is uh, pretty much fully literate, uh, I can't go to a school in Philadelphia where at least half of the students are reading past the fifth grade level. So. I can tell you my experiences with the Cuban education. The first thing I really caught my attention about Cuba is about 7.15 or 7.30 in the morning, 
you look around and you see black men with their children going to school. It's almost like a cultural habit. No matter how, no matter what the situation is in the home, there might not be just a piece of bread or coffee or whatever, but all of the men are highly involved in their children getting education. When you look around, you look in the streets, you'll see brothers with their kids going to school. I mean, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about maybe 85 or 90 percent of black men are highly involved in their kids' education. That's in Havana. Now you go to the East, I would probably say it's probably 100 percent. But I think it's basically because the Cubans really protect and talk about their heroes. They talk about Antonio Maceo, you know, and what they went through to free themselves from slavery, you know? I mean, and the young kids know it. They know their culture. And uh, Fidel has been able to instill in them the importance of not only being a good citizen in Havana or in Cuba, but being a good international citizen and being involved and participating in the process, you know? And uh, it was amazing because when all of the Cubans went to Venezuela, the major thing was medicine and education. Medicine and education, medicine and education, medicine and Haiti, medicine and education. Philadelphia, fifth grade, Jamaica, third grade for people that for Afro-American Jamaican men. They drop out of school. Mm -hmm. But the Cuban society is, is really, it's very literate, it's very, it's very conscious about culture and music. You know, you find it amazing because they have so little based on the economic blockade. People don't talk about the blockade. But the blockade is a noose, a noose that they physically, physically have been fighting for probably since the beginning of the revolution. And, it, and it's hard for them to move. It's hard for them to get food. It's hard for them to get medicine. But what did they do? They created their own health system with their own alternatives. Standing skipper that Cuba, we have uh, we call uh, family doctor on every block because for us primary care is fundamental. <coughs> primary care you cannot wait for a person to be sick to be taken to a doctor, right? So whenever you have a symptom, you have on your block a doctor and a nurse living there in your block. You go there. They see you, they make the analysis, they prescribe the medication, you go to the pharmacy, you may not have the money, if you don't have the money, the medicine could be given to you for free, right? If you don't have the means, and you prove that you don't have the means at the time. You could be a retired person, right? You could be a single mother that is not working, that is taking care of the kids or something. You prove that the medicine is given to you free. Then you go to the And then, if what you have requires you to be referred to the hospital, then the doctor is going to refer to you to the hospital and then you go to the hospital. So the hospital will never be the first option that you have. The first option at any time during the day or night is in your block. And primary care is important. So this part, I mean, this system that we have uh, gained prestige all around the world for these two things, education and health. There might be other things in Cuba that we have not handled properly. But education and health, I mean that, I mean, nobody can come and point at us and say you did this wrong and you did that wrong. Because everybody knows that even the Cubans, sometimes you read the news, that the Cubans are leaving the country because uh, you, if you go to Miami or Florida, you see the people coming on raft. And it, when you talk to them, all of them have either high school or are university graduates. <laughs> I'm telling you, and that's the truth. 
because this is the first thing Fidel did in 1961 was a national campaign against illiteracy. Yeah. Many people volunteered to go to the mountains, to the rural areas, to teach people how to read and write. That's important. As I said, this, this was our policy. That was a decision by our government who put huge amount of resources into that task, right? So it depends on every country. And you cannot copy. You cannot copy from Cuba, from uh, whichever country. You have to be, I mean, here I think you have to increase and put emphasis on the community job. You see, the communities are important. You see, and this neighborhood, and on that, the, the, the organization you belong to can be helpful. You, know, you can work with the local governments, you know, to promote all of this kind of education, you know, among the people so that people can go to school, so that people who may be a teachers can volunteer to teach and to teach uh, some people who are illiterate to know how to read and write. So there are many things that could be done, but you have to develop, you know, your ideas and see which ways could be found to, for the betterment of the communities of the society and the poor people. As I say, poor people does not mean black people, it mean poor people because I've been here in the States at homes of white people who live even sometimes worse than some black people. So, so, so it's a question of the poor people in general, speaking, you see, that need to be helped so that they can read, write, and move ahead in society. That's what I can say. Appreciate it. Thank you. Let's take a couple of questions and then maybe this one. There are two hands. Just do both of you and then maybe you can have the panelists respond. Yeah, both of you. We can take both of you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to the panelists. This was really, really enlightening. And um, it, it begged a lot of questions for me because there was a lot of connections made to, you know, the modern understanding of political education and ideological education and what is missing and why, why is there a disconnect. And I think, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the gentleman. Skipper. Skipper? You're going to skip you made a really interesting point about um, there being, you know, a communist movement pre-Fidel. I know every one of us understand how tremendously important Fidel was, but there had to be some type of groundwork of consciousness in order to make Fidel happen and for Fidel to understand the, dy the dynamism of, you know, the black population in Cuba and how their culture and their community allowed for there to be a blossoming of socialism that was really, you know, spearheaded by the black, you know, proletariat experience. And I think that was amazing. And I, I just want to say, as, you know, um, I just wanted to know a little bit more about that. Um, I'm really fascinated with Cuba. And I really think that, you know, as a, a revolutionary project that worked, it gives people an idea of what it can look like outside of the United States understanding of, you know, government and, and democracy outside of the liberal notion because a lot of people are still really captured by that liberal notion. So, you know, to tie it all together, what Anthony said about, you know, education, education in America here is a very individualist proposition. So when you think about education, you think about individual success, you don't think about collective community success. So I was just wondering if you could, someone could expound on, you know, a little bit about, you know, the consciousness pre-Castro, you know? And you said there was a communist understanding. There wasn't very much literacy, particularly for black people, but how did that kind of coalesce in order to create that you know, foundation? I think that's a really interesting thing. I know this is about Castro. I don't want to decenter Castro, but I just want to be able to understand some of that, you know, because it also illuminates you know, Castro and how integral he was to black people, generally, pan-African black people, and just you know, understanding you know, the black working class as a unique group or spearhead group for understanding the totality of class. I just, maybe someone can 
you know, give a little bit of background on that. That was a really curious question. Well, let me go back to Haiti. Because Haiti, the Haitian Revolution is key to all the development in the Caribbean. You know, people, I don't think, really understand the importance of Haiti and the Haitian leadership and the connection that they had to that whole area. If you look at the map, you'll see that between Cuba, Haiti, and Jamaica is about 37 miles. It's about 23 million people of African descent. People don't realize that uh, Cuba, the Cuban port of Matanza had the deepest port. And so the majority of the slave ships, starting back in the early 16th and 17th century, started coming straight into Cuba, going down to Haiti and going to Jamaica and further down. But at the same time, this is what Fidel and Chavez always want to emphasize there became a tremendous resistance among the slaves. And when the slaves defeated the Haitians, that set a whole different dynamic through the Caribbean, carried on by Maceo, Antonio Maceo. And they had this constant participation in people of African descent in the fight for independence against the Spain, against the Spaniards. But understand, the key to that, this is what Chavez said to me, this key to that was the Haitian Revolution. Because the Haitian Revolution took Simone Bolivar in when he was crippled, when he was broke, when he was bent down. And they made an agreement with Bolivar, listen, we're gonna give you gold, we're gonna give you all the material aid you need, and we're also gonna give you soldiers with the understanding that you go into Colombia, into Venezuela, which was that one country, to free the slaves. You follow me? But Bolivar sort of did not free the slaves. But then you come with Maceo. And Maceo will tell you in Guantanamo, this is what these guys come from. They come from a fighting culture. They have been fighting between, between Haiti, Jamaica, and Cuba, the east of Cuba, for the last 170 years. So people would tell you, I'm not a Fidelista, I am Maceo. I'm from Antonio Maceo. My grandfather, or my great-grandfather, was fighting against slavery because my great-great-grandfather is either from Jamaica or from Haiti. You know, so they got this fighting tradition, fighting constantly for independence. And Chavez and Fidel understood that. That's why they tried their best to pay the debt back to the people of African descent who have sacrificed their lives to build these countries. Well, the Communist Party Blacks began to enter into the Communist Party in Cuba. What do you say, Felix? 1921, 1922? Oh, yeah, 1912. I mean, they, they, they were very active right at the turn of the century. Yeah. yeah but, uh, I mean, the, uh, let me tell you that Blacks' participation in the struggle on October the 10th, 1868, was when mm, the process of the revolution in Cuba began. When one uh, slave owner decided to free slaves, right? And from then, slaves began fighting against Spaniards. The Spain was the country that colonized Cuba, right? And uh, you had a lot of important fighters, as the one he mentioned, Antonio Maceo, Jose Martí. Now, uh, there were different process, the, the different stages of the revolutionary process in Cuba, right? And uh, ever since 1912, there was a black revolution in Cuba. 
1912 that was destroyed by the forces of the then government, right? And then uh, we call in Cuba uh, the revolution of the 12th because most black were exterminated. No, because, yeah, 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 in one day. Because then they were fighting for equal rights and they were organized already. The first Communist Party of Cuba is founded in 1925 by Julio Antonio Meya, who is another fighter of the Cuban revolutionary process, right? And ever since the blacks have been involved, right? We have had a lot of uh, black leaders, you know, helping the revolution during the different stages of the revolution. That's why he was, men he was mentioning uh, Juan Almeida, and uh, as well as Juan Almeida, there have been many of the blacks who have been helping the Cuban revolution all along. So it is not something that began yesterday. I mean, it began at the beginning of the 20th century. And even before that, when the slaves were freed and they began fighting for the independence of the country, right? Because you, don't, you do not need to belong to a party to fight for the independence, right? So they began fighting for the independence way before the party as such was founded in Cuba. When they were freed, they began fighting for the independence. And all along, ever since, they began getting much more conscious and uh, they uh, began developing other ways of struggle, as was the one of a membership to a party, organization. And uh, ever since, you know, we have been evolving up until the party that we have now today in Cuba, which is made up of, you know, many people, including black, white and everybody. Okay. Steve, make it short. Yeah, I, I know we all have to eat, and that's more important than and a lot of other things. But um, my, my issue is about organization, and we're trying to organize here now. And um, the experience of the Cubans organizing is a, a, a very, very fertile place for us to, to, to gain from. However, our own organization, sometimes we discount, and I think we, it, it's important that, that we remember we have been very organized people. We have what Barack used to call an underground educational system that has been doing Boku work and educating us. That's why we're here, and we have to recognize and articulate our, our appreciation for that and our uh, work with that underground educational system that exists in our community. To, to continue to, to bring that education to our people. Um, I think that's really important. Uh, the, uh, some story, there's one other thing I wanted to... Organizational experience. We have organizational experience. We have been fighting by, valiantly, and the world recognizes our organizational experience, particularly in the civil rights movement, and, 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 the, and the revolutionary movements that have been going on in our neighborhoods right up to today. We have to, we have to it, it's important for us to acknowledge that to ourselves and, and express the confidence that Fidel expressed in his people. We need to express in our people. Our people might not be able to read, but they're strong and they're intelligent and they will learn to read with with, with the help of all of us. But, but we have really important resources that, that deserve our attention. So uh, that was just my comment. Thanks. Mm -hmm.